Good morning, everyone. It is good to see you. I know others will be coming in, but uh, I just wanted to say hello this morning. I trust you've had a good week. Uh, did you all remember to get your communion cups this morning as you came in? How many need communion cups? Everyone? A lot of people? You have yours? All right. When we get there, if you need one, let me know, and we'll make sure the ushers uh, get you one this morning later in the service. Well, it's been a hectic week for a lot of folks, hasn't it, this week? I want you to, this morning I wanted to share with you a scripture from Isaiah, really it's Isaiah chapter 55, uh, and if you this morning haven't read that, I, I encourage you to go back to that sometime this week and, and read that. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3 and then 6 through 7. It says, come everyone who, who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for which is not bread and you labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and, and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. And then in verses 6 and 7, he goes on to say, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon this morning. As you and I have gathered in this place, I really don't want you to go away and be able to talk about what the pastor wore or what the pastor necessarily, how he said it. What I want you to, or, or even how the praise team, how wonderful they do and how great they look and how energetic they are and their smiles and their effervescent personalities. I don't even want you to necessarily walk away this morning from this service and, I don't know, talk about your friendships. But what I do want to make sure you walk away from is that you met God here. You met Him in this place. And when you came here today, you were coming to seek Him, to find Him, to see what He has to say, to see what He wants to pour into your life. Because he said that I'm here, and those that seek me can find me. And so my prayer is today, above everything else, what you'll remember is that you met God, that he spoke, that you listened, that you responded, that his Holy Spirit enveloped your life this morning. Have you ever had those weeks where it seems like there's a ton of stuff going on and it just flooded in? Have you ever had those? You just feel kind of frazzled by the time you reach here on Sunday as you look back on your week. There's been a lot of that going on this week. And so I just want to start the service this morning. I want to pray together. Because I just believe that with all the things that are happening, for instance, um, Melissa Kigvine isn't here this morning because this week, well, first of all, she has a friend Lori, who's in the hospital on an innovator because of COVID. But her friend lost her mother yesterday to COVID. And so she's trying to pray and deal with friends and overwhelm with that. We've got, um, we have Susan. It's going to be going to Mayo tomorrow, second opinion on the cancer. We have a member who has just been a member who needs our prayers because they're going through this devastating financial time in their, in their lives. And we really do need spiritual awakening, don't we? We need it for us. We need it for our community. We, we need it for our world. We need people's lives need this awareness, this awakening, this trans, 
transformational moment where they encountered the living God and, and He brings them freedom and hope and healing and power into their lives so that they can see more clearly than they've ever seen. Because we live in an age that seems to be oblivious to God. And so all of those things, plus a ton more things that are going on just everyday life, overwhelm us. But this morning, I want us to know that God is here. He's in this place. And that you and I can trust Him, and we can rely on Him, and we can turn to Him. And so let's pray and ask this morning that above everything else, we encounter the living God. Can we do that? Father... This morning, I've got to be really honest with you and, and tell you that I'm a little overwhelmed this morning. I come into your presence understanding what I need. I need you. I need to hear from you. I, I need to encounter you. I need to experience your presence. And, and Lord, I'm here this morning as much as anyone else is a worshiper. I've come into this place because I believe that when I'm gathered with my Christian brothers and sisters, that when we lift our voices together in a unified purpose of song and, and prayers, that, that your ear is attentive to this place and you hear what's going on and, and you understand what's happening around us and, and you're going to meet us here. And Lord, I'm here as much as anyone else as a worshiper because I need to hear from you. I need your touch this morning. I need you. I need you this morning to pour grace into my life, just as you're pouring it into everyone's life. Lord, we're here this morning and, and we bring to you ourselves and our needs and, and all that we are. I, Lord, I think of Melissa this morning who's overwhelmed trying to to pour grace and to love a friend who's in the hospital on an innovator and who, Lord, COVID is right now seemingly having its way and the loss of a mother that she, of that friend that she's known all these years. And Lord, when we feel so helpless to do anything in situations of those that we care about and we love, Jesus, it, it takes a great deal out of us. So I pray this morning that you'll refresh Melissa. I pray this morning you'll give her courage and you'll put her sights on Jesus in a measure that will strengthen her and encourage her and allow her to, to be able to reflect you with such clarity and such glory in the lives of Lori and family and friends that everyone will notice it. And then I pray for Lori in the hospital. And Lord, I ask you to work through all of these avenues that you have, the, the avenues of, of medicine. And, and thank you so much for the giftedness of doctors and nurses and, and for their care in our lives. And, and I just pray this morning. I ask you that, Lord, if this is the avenue you want to use, then use it. But I also know that you're the great physician. And all I have to do or anyone is to touch the hem of your garment and somehow in your presence, you exercise your power in our lives. And I'm praying that this morning for Lori, that you exercise the healing power of the Savior and the kingdom in her life. But above everything, I want your will to be accomplished in all of this. Whatever your plans and your purposes are, whatever you're doing, I ask you that you'll be glorified in it. And I ask you to comfort and to care and to sustain Lori. And, and may you, in this situation, may you gain glory and honor. And may everyone recognize that, that God, the God of all the ages, was involved in this, ministering in this. I pray for Susan this morning as she's going, her and Mark are going to go to Mayo and get another opinion about this cancer that she's facing and that she has faced. And, and Lord, I, I'm just praying. I'm asking that Jesus tomorrow or, or whatever day she finally sees the doctor at Mayo, that you will have gone before her and given them wisdom and they've looked at all the 
the reports and they do their own testing. And when the final words come down and, and they sit and talk with her and Mark, I, I pray that you will have empowered their thinking. You will have empowered their abilities far beyond what they could do on their own. And that, that Jesus, whatever they say, it will be guided and directed within the plan that you have for Susan's life. I pray this morning that, Lord, you're our last word. You are the one that, that speaks. And not only do we listen, but everything around us pays attention to the power and the authority of our God. And so I pray for Susan and Mark that, that Lord, you'll just pour into their lives your abundant grace and your power and your authority and you will encourage them and you will give them strength and and lord everything that they need i pray they will find it in their relationship with you and that you'll love on them in a measure that they have yet to experience i just pray that as we leave them in your hands, that you're going to do something that is so phenomenal, something so powerful, something that is so overwhelming, that only by talking about it in terms of Jesus can we explain it. And so I leave them in your care, the one who loves them more than anyone could ever be loved in our minds, the, the one who sacrificed everything there was a sacrifice to redeem them and to save them. I pray for those that are going through difficulties in our congregation today, and whether it's financial or whatever it may be, the struggles of life. I pray that, that you have promised us that you're sufficient, that you'll always be with us. And so I ask you to move upon every home and in every circumstance, whether it's parents or grandparents or teenagers or children that lord whatever they need in these moments i pray you'll pour into their lives i ask you to take the what seems to be the impossible situations and by the power of the kingdom of god i pray that you will intervene and that you'll work through your people that you'll work through avenues that you choose but that you will make all things right and that we will get to see how in life you do not forsake us, but you abundantly supply what we need. And I pray that you'll do that in our homes and our lives. I pray that today we'll be reminded of the power and the ability and the authority of our God to do amazing things because nothing, nothing is impossible for you. And so I pray today that, that we will recognize it and acknowledge it and, and that, Lord, what you're going to do that we haven't even seen yet, the way you're going to work is going to be phenomenal and amazing and miraculous. And we want to praise you for all that you're doing. We are not lost. We are not forsaken. The world is not bigger than our God. And so this morning... We turn to you and tell you we need you and we're trusting you. And Lord, somehow do the impossible. Make it possible for us. And then Jesus, the spiritual awakening that's so needed, not only among us, but in our community and around the globe. We need this world needs to be shaken at its foundation with the powerful entrance once again of the kingdom of God spreading among His people, setting them on fire, setting them on a, a journey of, of holy living and holy faith in Christ, whereby all authority and all power is given to Jesus in our individual lives and in our churches and in our homes and in our work and wherever we are. We are yielding ourselves and relinquishing authority to Jesus. When we do that, you said that when my people who are called by name, my name will humble themselves and pray, call on me, that you will restore the land. And I'm praying today that we, the church, we will pray for your, your spiritual awakening within our hearts. That we'll pray that the Holy Spirit will come and fall and stir us and and ignite a fire within us, a passion to burn 
that burns for Jesus so much and so powerful that nothing in this world will distract us. We need you to awaken us. And so, Lord, I'm praying, send your Holy Spirit rain down on us. Rain down on us in all your presence and all your power and rain down in us in all your grace. Holy Spirit, once again, draw us and call us to yourself. Until we fall before you once again and acknowledge you as Lord and Savior and Master. And until our lives become the conduits of your likeness and of your presence and of your power and of your grace, until our lives are the conduit whereby the Holy Spirit can live and move and have His being in us, and we can reflect clearly the image of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ to this world. And we can live in that power. We can live in that freedom. We can live in that healing. We can live in that faith that though unseen fully accomplished, it will be a faith that says we fully and completely trust God. And that we will follow Him in everything we do and say. So start that awakening this morning among us. Start it in our lives. Let the hunger burn. Let the yearning increase. But allow us, I pray this morning, allow us to be transformed by your presence and your truth. Now as we worship, I pray that we'll turn our focus and our eyes, if we haven't already, to you. And that we'll worship you with every portion of the energy that is within us. That we will give you praise and glory and honor because we realize this morning that our prayers, that all that we desire, that all we hunger for, that all we want is Jesus Christ. It's found in Him. And so this morning we will point and focus our eyes and our attention on you. We, I pray, give us the power in worship to lay ourselves at the foot of the cross and receive and accept the grace that you want to pour into our lives today. You are our only hope for true victory and freedom. Let us learn to live in the freedom of Christ, I pray. And let us worship in that freedom this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me. Let's worship Him.
loves you and died on the cross for you and for me.
for your saving grace. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Our hearts clear? Okay. Can we really live the Christian life? That's a big question, is it not? One of the big questions. I mean, we... Um, we live in a day and an age that is seemingly so contrary to, well, not seemingly, it is, so contrary to who Jesus Christ is and who Jesus Christ wants us to be. And the pressures are so overwhelming at every turn on our homes, our families, the kids, uh, the older adults, whoever you are, we're always being challenged and our faith is being challenged at at every area of life, whether it's at work, at home, wherever it is, whether we're watching TV, whether we're talking to a friend, there are things that are happening that challenge whether our faith is real and we believe what we believe and we're walking in that faith or whether it's just something that we're hanging on to and it really has no value whatsoever. And, and so the Christian life that we live in today is being challenged with such intensity that the question becomes, can we really live the Christian life? 
today? Can we really be expected to, to live the way Jesus has called us to live? Can we really do the things He's called us to do? Can we really live these holy lives that He says He wants us to step into through the power of His Holy Spirit so that we can be more like Him, so that the world can see Him in us more clearly than ever before? There's a letter in the Bible, a small letter. It's the letter of Jude. It comes right before the book of Revelation. And I know most people know where the book of Revelation is. It's the last book in the Bible. And there are more people that want to talk about Revelation and the coming of Christ. And so I know we know where that book is. So, so the book of Jude, this short letter. It's got one chapter. Um, it's got 25 verses in that chapter, that letter. It is... One of those letters that, if we're not cautious, we kind of look over. But there's this, this powerful moment in Jude's letter to the church, to Christians, that you and I really need to get a hold of this morning. And so there's this big idea that I, I want us to, to really wrap our minds around, our hearts around, and I want us to leave with it. And that big idea is that God's sustaining grace is is a grace that is more than able to empower us to live our lives, the lives that Jesus called us to. It's absolutely possible this morning, absolutely possible to live that life that Jesus called us to in today's world. And we're going to remember it's called sustaining grace. And so that's what I want us to look at this morning is, is that sustaining grace. So in Jude, if you're there... I want you to look at one verse with me, verse 24. It is the next to the last verse in this letter. Jude chapter 1, verse 24. All right? And here's what it says. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and read the last verse too. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. Jude. We believe that Jude is the half-brother of Jesus and he's the one that wrote this letter. Um, He's writing to Christians. We can see that because in the latter part of verse 1, he said, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Jude wants the best for believers because in verse 2, he, he's looking at them and say, he's blessing or praying over them, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So he's saying, I, I want the absolute best for you in, in this life. In, in everything that God has for you. It's a letter of encouragement. It's a letter of warning. It's a letter of hope. But it's also a letter that calls believers to fight, if you were, would, for their faith. Now, fighting for their faith is not necessarily what our, our political agenda of our day and age would make us believe. When... When Jude talks about fighting for our faith in, in verse 3, as it were, when he says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for your faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. To contend for your faith. What he's talking about when he talks about fighting for the faith, he's talking about persevering in our faith. Day by day, moment by moment, uh, second by second, living in that faith and persevering in that faith and not giving up, not throwing in the towel, not walking away from that faith. And so in Jude, as you go through this chapter 1, verses 17 through 19, if you read through there, he begins to speak to the way that the people that are, are, people that are following this age, age's worldview, the way they live the depravity it imposes in their lives and, and the pressure to, to conform it uh, that, that's bringing some of those in the church 
He's concerned bringing them and challenging the way that they follow Jesus Christ. Uh, I mean, if you begin to look in those verses of 17 through 18, uh, he talks about the fact that in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. And he kind of summarizes everything that he's been saying before that. Because you see, in this letter, there are those people who have come in among them, he says, unnoticed. Which means they simply slipped in beside you. And now what they're teaching and what they're trying to teach you and pull you away from. Um, and so he summarizes those people that he says in these verses are causing division, worldly people, they're devoid of spirit. Uh, he's saying that these believers, that he's saying that believers in the church live absolutely different than those ungodly people as he referred to them way back in, in verse 4 when he said that for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality and deny our Master and Lord Jesus Christ. These people are those that not only have crept in unnoticed among them, uh, but we, can, we may not be able to clearly tie down who these ungodly people are by name, but Jude gives us this clear picture of their attitudes, their demeanors, their lifestyles, and the tactics that they're using among believers. And the reason that they're seen as ungodly is because they pervert the grace of God and they deny Jesus Christ. That's what it says in verse 4. Those ungodly people seem to have embraced, if you would, a number of people's, uh, rather a number of possible heretical thoughts in, in their belief of, of who Jesus Christ is. And one of the things is certain as you read through this. They have taken biblical teachings such as grace and the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and they've taken them to these unbiblical conclusions where they no longer have to follow, at least they believe they don't, have to follow any of the moral laws that God has ever set down. There is this real possibility that Jude is talking about to these believers, the real possibility is that they could fall or stumble, or they could blow it because of these, this influence of these ungodly people that they're having in their lives. And that's what Jude is referring to, really, in, in verse 5. When you look back in verse 5, and he says, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. Uh, Jude is writing to them and telling them that there was a moment and a time that you fu fully knew this. You fully understood this about Jesus Christ. And now there's this concern that because of the influence of these ungodly people who have crept in among you, that you may be listening to them and you may be siding with them or you may be falling into their camp if you're not careful. First Peter, when he writes his letter, he reinforces kind of this, this whole notion that that possibility is is there because he's writing about some of the same things. And in his book, his letter in chapter 4, he wrote this in verses 3 and 4. You have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy. Their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness, wild parties, and their terrible worship of idols. Of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of the wild and destructive things they do, so they begin to slander you. Uh, Peter understood what Jude is talking about, that there is this possibility that you could fall, but you've been brought out of that. That's not what Christ has called you to, he says. What Jude is really asking here isn't as easy as some may claim, though. I just want to tell you that this morning. Uh, resisting the pressures of your peers or the majority of your community or the influence of your co-workers or the influence of the age that surrounds us at every turn, wherever we look or wherever we listen. The truth is that we found out that Jude's right in verse 5. Living different, contrary to the popular norms, is not only hard, but sometimes we find ourselves being influenced by those forces contrary to Jesus much more than, than we'd like to admit, right? You can smile with me. Come on. 
We live in a day and an age where you and I know together that it's hard to live the life that Christ has called us to, especially if we're trying to do it on our own, right? Because the influences that are all around us, sometimes even, even when we sit down and talk to someone with a contrary philosophy, they begin to make sense, right? Come on. There's a certain amount that begins to make sense. But isn't that the way it's always been? There's always a certain amount of truth in destructive philosophies and patterns, right? They go on. And so we understand that it's not easy, that it's hard to do these things. It's hard to live this life. And so I don't want you to think that Jude is looking at them and saying, I believe it's just simple. I believe it's just like that. Everything is good and and you're not going to have any problem. I don't think that's what Jude is saying as I read through this. What Jude is saying is, I understand it's hard. And I understand the influence is powerful. And I understand that the choices that we have to make, we have to be really cautious to make sure that we're following Christ. So when Jude calls us to persevere in our faith in the midst of these pressures, if, if I'm one of these Christians that are there in, in the church and I'm just kind of struggling because some of, my, some of these people are making a little bit of sense to me and it's been easier for me just to listen and easier for me to kind of walk alongside them a little bit. If I'm one of those people and Judah's writing me this letter, all of a sudden when he says, I want you to persevere in your faith in the midst of these pressures and, and I've been kind of giving in a little bit, then all of a sudden, this guilt for not being strong enough in my faith begins to rise up in me. There's where these old cliches that sometimes we've heard come in, right? You just need to give it all to Jesus. Or if you really love Jesus, thanks for the encouragement, but I really feel bad because the pressures are too great and and I don't know if I can handle it. And so I I get this frustration and this feeling of defeat. I mean, I really have been trying. But I don't know if you understand how hard it is to do this. But what if I, rather than using these old cliches, tell you that you can live resisting the pressures that are in this world that want you to live contrary to Jesus? What if I told you that we can resist those pressures? What if I tell you that Jude doesn't just tell you what you need to do, but he points us to the key that we need to unlock our full spiritual strength to resist giving in to the pressures of our world. As Jude ends his letter to the believers, it's in his doxology that he exposes the key. Look with me this morning back to or in verse 24. Is my mic going off? Cutting in and out. Well, I'll let you go back to verse 24. How's that? Because in this letter, at the, at the end, when, when he gives us doxology, if you will, and as he, as he gives us this doxology, oh, there we go. I can hear myself again. As he gives us doxology, it's where he exposes the key that you and I all need. That those that he's writing the letter to that they need. So I want you to look at that verse with me this morning, and there are really three quick things that I want us to look at together. And the first one is the question of what do you rely on? What are you and I really relying on to spiritually empower us moment by moment and and day by day? Uh, are, Are we relying on ourselves our own abilities, our own strengths? Are we relying simply on the pastor's sermon on Sunday? You are in so much trouble if you are. Are are you relying simply on uh, that one or two times a week that I I read my Bible alone and I think I got a little bit of, well, I think I got something that can help me out of it. Uh, Are you relying on the television preacher's that we get to turn on 
and we can find one about any time of the day or any time of the night. And, and we're, we're relying on them that they're going to give me something every day. Although they may be giving me truth, do, am I relying on all of these outward things to help me live a life that Christ has called me to? And am I doing it on my own strength? Because if I am, you and I are the ones that Jude is writing to. Because listen to what he says. In verse 24, he says, Now to him who is able. Now to him who is able. Jude is looking at us, and he is saying to us that this, I'm not writing to you and telling you and giving you this list of do this, do this, and do this, and you will get the power you need. I am writing to you and telling you it's about a person. Not a thing. I'm telling you it's about a person. And that person is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And He is the one that I'm praying to for you. And I am praying that you will see that now to Him who is able. To the one who through His death and resurrection overcame hell, death, the grave, and sin. And through Him, you and I can be set free. And not only through Him can we be set free of those sins, we can live the life He's called us to live daily if we'll stay in that relationship in His Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit of the living God to dwell in us and to guide us and to be the authority over us and in us in every area of our life. Jude says when you're in that relationship, you are able to live the life He's called you to. Because living it is not about what I can do. It is about the relationship that I have with the person, Jesus Christ, through His Holy Spirit. And as I live in that relationship, I'll find the strength that I need every day to live the life He's called me to. To reflect Him the way He's called me to reflect Him. In my conversations, in my actions, in my responses, in everything that I do in life. If I live in that relationship, surrendered, and His Holy Spirit has the authority in my life that I've given, and I live in that relationship, and I'm, I'm listening to what God says, and, and I'm trying to, with all that I am, I want to follow His will in my life. If I'm living in that, Jude says that's the way you defeat the pressures of the world that are around you. It's in a person, not in your own strength. The second thing, and what you notice is, and it's a question, can I live out faith without failing? Do we really believe that we can live out our faith without stumbling and without falling? That I can really, do I believe that I can live this way? Jude says I can in the person of Jesus Christ in a relationship. But there are so many in my world and that we live in that tell me that I can't do that. That I am going to be bound to my sinful behavior and there's not a thing I can do about it. It's the old cliche, the devil makes me do it and I'm not bigger than him. Folks, if I can't live the life that Jesus called me to, why did he call me to it? Do I serve a God that hung a carrot out before me and said, here's what I want you to do, but you're never going to be able to reach it. And he keeps dangling it. Do I believe, do I believe this morning that the God who sacrificially gave his life and overcame the powers of death, hell, sin, and the grave, do I believe that he is calling me to something he knows I cannot do. I contend with you this morning, no. That is not what the Scripture says. The Scripture is telling me, and what Jude is telling me is, that he, listen to verse 24, now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling, to keep us from failing, to keep us from falling. Oh, does that mean I'm not going to be human anymore? No. You're still going to be human and you're still going to need every day, just like I am, the redeeming, sanctifying grace of the Holy Spirit in my life that, 
that takes my humanity and aligns it with Jesus? Am I going to have moments where I have, oops, yes, because of my stupidity, I'm going to do that? Am I going to have moments that I wish I hadn't said to my wife what I said? Yes, I'm going to have those moments. Every wife in here just smiled and looked at their husband. I am not alone, am I? Am I going to have those moments when I, the Holy Spirit is going to check me and tell me, you shouldn't have done that, and that's not like Jesus, and you need to apologize. And you need to change it. Yes, I'm going to have those moments. But the difference is, am I going to fall away from my faith? Am I going to do something so horrendous and so terrible that it's going to be so unlike Jesus that I'm going to succumb and begin to become conformed to the world's way of thinking? No. Jude says no. You don't have to fail and you don't have to stumble because He who is able can keep you from that. It's in that relationship that I'm surrendered to Jesus Christ through His Holy Spirit. That every day of my life, as I live in that surrendered, yielding uh, pattern of, of life, in my relationship with Him, that He will guide me and lead me. He'll check me. He'll rebuke me. He'll show me. He'll teach me. He'll help me mature and grow so that I don't do that again and again and again. Jude says you can live the life He's called you to live. And then finally, well, I, I guess I need to say this. If, if we don't believe we can live that life, we'll come to a point where we won't even try anymore. If I believe, if I live believing that it is inevitable that I'm going to stumble in my faith, that sinning is inevitable, then I'm saying that this world, now hear me, that this world, that the influence of my sinful nature, that the evil that permeates my world is bigger than my God. Bigger than Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and His resurrection. Essentially, I, I'm going to throw up my arms and give up and Jesus didn't come and He didn't die and he, he didn't rise so that I would stay unchanged. He died and rose again so that I would through His Spirit have the power to, to live the life He's called me to live. And if I believe I can't do that, I'll stop even trying and working in this relationship. And there are too many people followers of Christ that have thrown up their hands and say it is impossible to live this life. Because they don't believe God's big enough to take care of it. So my last question is, is our Savior big enough? Listen to the latter part of verse 24. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. Present you blameless. Do I really believe that Jesus will have the last word in all things? Do I really believe that His, his sacrifice was great enough and powerful enough that it may have overcome the grave and death? Do I believe it's powerful enough to help me overcome the pressures and the sin of this world so that I can live the way He's called me to, so that He can make me ready to meet God by making me every day more into the reflection of His image. Do I believe that? Do I believe that Jesus is who He says He is? That He's able to take my life from the moment that I surrender it to Him and as I live in that relationship with Him, do I believe that as I daily yield to His will, that He's able to take my life through my entire lifespan on this earth, and every day He is molding me and shaping me and 
and changing me and transforming me until every day I'm becoming more like Him in His reflection and the way that I live and who that I am until finally when the last day comes, whenever that is for me, whether He comes back or whether I die before then, I know that on that last day, this whole journey that I've taken, Jesus has been enough because He has allowed me and given me the strength and the power and shaped me and matured me and molded me till I get to the place that when I stand before God, I'm going to be able to claim the blood of Jesus. And Jesus is going to come and stand beside me and present me to the Father. And He's going to present me as ready and blameless in His sight because of who we've been together all of our life in this relationship. Do I believe that? Do I believe that Jesus is bigger than this world? Because that's what Jude is telling his readers. A matter of fact, Jude believes it so much that he goes on to say, I'm saying all this to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen! Jude says, I don't know how all you feel. But I know how I feel. I'm telling you that I'm going to trust you into the care of the one who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. And I believe it because He is the only God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And to Him is all glory and honor and majesty and dominion now and forevermore. My God, Jude said, and your God is big enough to allow you to live this life if you'll surrender to Him. If we'll do it every day and live in that relationship and that presence. So here's the big takeaway or the takeaway for you. Yes, a follower of Jesus Christ can live the holy life He calls them to in the environment of today's culture. It is possible. Amen? You can do this. Can you do it on your own? No. But in the relationship with Him, we can do this. So here's here's the action steps. For for this year, for for next year, as we go through the remainder of this year and into next year, crave everything Jesus wants to pour into your life through the Holy Spirit. Crave it. Go after it. Seek it. Passionately. Whatever it is in the Scripture, whatever truth Jesus has for us, through His Holy Spirit, crave that relationship with God and through His Holy Spirit in your life and yield to that and crave that every day. Want it. Desire it. Want it when you walk into worship. Want it when you do your devotions. Want it when you're at work. Want it while you're at home. Want more and more and more of Jesus. Make that your absolute craving. I want Him more than I want the world. And then cooperate throughout this, in the next year, cooperate with the active grace of the Holy Spirit by practicing the activities, the disciplines, and the practices that Jesus, Jesus modeled for us that keep us in that relationship, like prayer, like in the Word, like pouring grace out into other people's lives. Like surrendering our will to the Father's will at every turn. Those are the practices and the disciplines and and those things that Jesus modeled for us. And, And those are the things that we need to engage in to keep this relationship going. Always, and finally, always relinquishing the authority in our life to who? Jesus Christ, right? Relinquishing the authority of our life to Jesus Christ. I think these are the type of things that will help us receive a spiritual awakening. These are the type of things that will poise us for what God wants to do. And so my challenge is that you and I will will grab a hold of of this verse 24 and understand that He is able to keep us from falling and to present us before God blameless. 
it's possible to live this life. So when you say that I go to the church of the Nazarene, a holiness church, and someone says, holiness, what's that? And you try to explain that that simply means that I'm wanting the reflection and the image of Jesus to be a part of my life more and more, and, and that I want to live every day of my life the way he's called me to live it, surrendered to him, you can, you can actually believe and say to them, when they ask you, can you do that? Yes, I can. Can't do it by myself. Neither can you. But in my relationship with Jesus Christ, he gives me everything I need to live the way he's called me to live. So stay in that relationship this year. And let's receive everything God has for us so that we can live the life he's called us to live. You don't have to throw in the towel of faith. Jesus is bigger than that right? All hearts clear? Father, today, as we prepare ourselves for communion, I pray that in these moments, we will begin by acknowledging, acknowledging that you are God and that you are able. And so I ask of you today that in these moments that we share communion together, that we'll remember your sacrifice, we'll remember your love, we'll remember your great grace that's being poured into our lives through your Holy Spirit, and we will remember that you gave that sacrifice not so that we would be overcome by this world, but rather in you we could be overcomers of this world. And that today when we take communion, let it be our testimony that we believe that you are more than able to keep us from falling. That you will present us before the Father, blameless. And it's because not of ourselves, but because of what you can do in us and are doing in us. And let that be a part of our testimony today as we take communion. Let it be part of our praise that we believe that our God is big enough for that. And that through Jesus Christ, through you and your sacrifice and resurrection. Every day of our lives, grace is being poured into us. Enough grace to keep us. And so, Lord, I pray that we'll search our hearts and our minds today. And we will prepare ourselves to receive communion and the grace that you want to pour into our lives. And let it be a reminder of what you offer us in Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, I invite you to take your communion. Jesus sat in an upper room with his disciples. And as he sat in that upper room on that Passover meal to recall how God had delivered them out of Egypt, to relive that moment. He also was ushering in the new covenant and letting them know that in him, everything that had been promised is being fulfilled. In the same way that the mighty God delivered an entire nation out of Egypt, that he was going to deliver the world from their sin. This morning, as you take this bread, remember that the God of all the ages loves you enough that he sacrificially laid down his life. This is his body that he gave for you. The blood that he shed on the cross was a sacrificial offering to cover the sins of the world, then and forever, and in the past. And as you take this this morning and you drink, remember, Jesus said, remember that this is the remission of your sins. He gave his life for you. Jesus, how can we ever thank you enough for who you are, for what you've done? Your love in our lives every day is more powerful, is more life-changing than we ever deserved. And every day your Holy Spirit empowers us 
to live the cross-style life that you've called us to live. To be the reflection of your image. And I pray that today that we give witness and testimony to the power of our God to allow us to live that life because he can and he does. And I pray that today that as we leave this place that we will remember that our God is more than able no matter what we're going to face this week to keep us in his grace So I pray that we will crave more and more of you because as we do, as we do, you're going to be pouring more and more of your grace into us. Make this a tremendous week, I pray. And let us leave here with the confidence that we can live this life, not on our own, but Jesus with you. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And we'll give you all the praise for Jesus. We ask it in your name. This week, I want you to remember this with me. Paul said in Colossians, For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden in Christ, in God. This week, what people may see in the beginning, this human form that I have and you have, is not the full life that we have. Because the full life that we have is hidden in Christ in us. And we reflect that life every day. You, my friend, are redeemed through him. You are empowered through him. And so throughout this week, live in that power and that knowledge that you are able, because he is able, in Jesus' name. Stand, shake hands, have a great week, or bump elbows, I'm sorry.